Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started because we've got another um, uh, mini review session that's pretty tight in terms of time. Very impressed with how many of you are here today, um, this morning, uh, bright and early, um, especially if any of you went to Wild Bills last night, which I hear went on quite late. <laughs> so um, it's my pleasure um, to co-chair this session uh, with uh, my colleague, uh, Pascal Imbol. Um, uh, my name is uh, Sarah Kirk, and uh, we're going to be kicking off with um, our um, uh, personal perspectives from Ryan Drummond, who's going to be talking about the weight of living. Um, so, um, Ryan, if you don't mind me calling you Ryan, <laughs> rather than it says Mr. Drummond here, that sounds quite, quite formal. <laughs> um, Ryan is a civil engineering tech um, and works for the city of Edmonton. He's dealt with obesity all his life and has succeeded in losing a lot of weight post-bariatric surgery. So he's going to come up here and share his story with you. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. The title of my uh, discussion is I Would Do It Again Every Day and Twice on Sunday. The story kind of leads up to what these guys are going to talk about, so please be patient. And I apologize if I'm nervous because this is the first time I've done something like this. So, uh, first off, I'd first off like to thank all the staff at the Royal Alex who treated me like their family throughout the story you're about to hear. But first, I'll start with some background. I was always a big kid, but my parents preached sports year round, so that most likely kept me in that you know, stage one obesity level. When I grew up, calories was a foreign word. Food portions was always seconds and large. And the, the pop fridge was always open. Once sports ended in high school and my eating habits didn't change, weight gain was imminent. It wasn't until my first son was born in 2012 that I decided to get on the scale in the delivery room. And then I realized I was 470 pounds. It was a shock because I was still very active doing hikes up mountains, but somehow I managed to gain all this weight. In early 2015, I was admitted to the White Wise Clinic in Edmonton after experiencing a roller coaster ride of many losses and gains throughout the, you know, eat less, move more. I was always afraid of surgery, but after many attempts at losing weight, it seemed to be the only issue. And especially after both my boys had surgery at the Stollery in the first three months of being born, I couldn't be scared they weren't scared. On November 25th, 2015, I had the VSG surgery, and it just ha so happened that when the day I had my surgery, my wife signed her consent for the RNY the same day. After surgery, I thought I was the ideal patient. I w didn't need pain meds, and I, I kept walking the ward back and forth like it was a marathon. I felt great. I was dis discharged in less than 48 hours. Day eight post-op, when I was on my soft liquid diet, I started to get some minor fevers, so I decided to give my nurse at the clinic a call. We kind of went through things like, how was your incision sites? How was everything feeling? I'm like, it's just, it's fine. So he just told me to take some Tylenol. If it went away, you should be fine. I found about day 10, I started to get really dehydrated, so I decided to really focus on my fluids. On day 11, it just happened to be my dad's birthday. So we all went to Chili's for dinner with my whole family in town. All of a sudden, before the dinner arrived, I started to get really cold, but I was wearing shorts because I wanted to be comfortable even though it was December. So I decided to go warm up by the bar. Once I warmed up, I decided to get up and go back to the table. As soon as I stood up, I felt like I got stabbed. My whole body started shaking and I started to fade out of consciousness. The bartender helped me back to the table and as I told him, maybe it's time to go to the hospital, my whole family started arguing about the logistics of who's gonna take me since my dad had my mom with MS and in a wheelchair. My wife had my two boys my sister had to go work that night, so eventually I just grabbed my own car keys and started walking out where my dad came in tow. Halfway through the trip, he was driving to the Mr. Cordia, and I kept trying to urge him that I had to go to Royal Alex. At that point, I started to fade out, so I decided to call 911. Literally did he know that my phone was hooked up to the sink, and all of a sudden there was someone in the car speaking to him saying 911, and he started freaking out. 
They asked us to pull over, and an ambulance was soon there. After getting in, into the emergency room, they hooked him up with two IVs of fluids and a lot of pain meds. I felt fine. They did some more blood work and urine tests, and I thought I was feeling good. Eventually, a porter came to move me to uh, another room. I was thinking I was gonna get triaged in a smaller room. Next thing you know, I was in ER trauma. As soon as I pulled up, the nurse told him to put a crash cart next to me. Of course, being a funny guy, I turned over to my wife and said, there's a crash cart. I hope, we, I, hope we, I hope I can make it. She started crying. <laughs> to kind of try to lighten the mood again, I looked up on the wall and I saw, I saw some body bags. I pointed out to her that didn't work too good. <laughs> At that point, they told me my blood pressure was 50 over 30 and it was steadily declining. They had to administer a drug that was monitored by three nurses to, just to make sure that nothing happened. Throughout the night, different groups would come in, as I was told, one was the ICU team, one was the bariatric resident team, and the other was the, just the emergency doctors. They would never talk to me. They would always talk in secret in the corner. Later, once my things kind of stabilized, I went through a series of tests and x-rays. Later, I was transferred to the OBS unit. That next morning, Dr. York, the bariatric fellow, came to tell me that I was being rushed to emergency surgery to clean up my entire body cavity, which was infected, and that there was a leak present. That, that surgery was on Sunday afternoon. I did not wake up until the next night on Monday in the ICU. It was a, it was a realizing experience to have a breathing tube down your throat because you, every time you moved, it would really just choke you out, and it was a surreal experience. A week later, after kind of stabilizing a bit, I was transferred back to an OBS bed. At that point, it was the first time I seen my kids because they, they weren't allowed in the ICU because it, it was just too much to handle. That They were walking down the hall. I was excited, but right behind him was again Dr. York. I was then rushed back into another emergency cleanup surgery because the infection had flared up again. At that point, I was back in the ICU for another two weeks. Before, right before Christmas, I was transferred into Unit 34. At that point, it got pretty tough because my wife got the flu over Christmas, so I didn't get to see my boys on Christmas. Numerous procedures later to keep draining fluids that I was collecting around my lungs and lots of drains installed to take all the stuff out. And I'll keep every week, I'd have that leak test. Maybe next time, it'll be healed. In February, after being in the hospital about three months, I decided to get the stint put in. I was always hesitant to get it because they always said that your body could reject it, there was a low all these low, the low rates of acceptance and that it wasn't the best feeling thing. After some convincing by Dr. Birch, I decided to go through it because this was the new model from overseas. Now the, the stint's problem will always would be, from what I was told, is it will, with my leak at the top of my stomach, it would always slide down and not actually protect it. But this one was designed to actually be into your esophage esophageal and into your uh, intestinal tract so it wouldn't slip. Because of this, I, for, uh, for almost two weeks, I would be puking bile straight. At one point, no, after no, more, no Zofran or gravel or anything could take away the nausea, I believe they gave me a drug called Haldol, which was also an antipsychotic. After being on it for a while, I felt like I wasn't even in my body anymore, and I would rather have the nausea. My family was really struggling during this time with a, a wife with a one-year-old and a four-year-old, four so it was definitely tough. So since she had to wake up, take the kids to work, take the, I mean, take the kids to daycare before she goes to work, come home and do the same. Her parents lived in Fort McMurray, so they tried to come down as much as they could. And my mom, my dad had to take care of my mom who was wheelchair bound from MS. Eventually in March, it was offered home TPN since I hadn't had a sip of water in almost four months. Um, I, call, I did all the training, went home. My wife was ecstatic, the kids were ecstatic. I was happy, even in the first night, I managed to hook it up all myself. But within 24 hours later, all of a sudden out of nowhere, I started puking liters of blood. Back to the Royal I went. I was admitted to an ops ward after my wife had to go up to my old unit, talk to the bariatric team that I was still sitting in triage, holding a, gi a giant bag of blood that wouldn't stop puking and no nurse had had to see me yet. Two weeks later, it was probably one of the greatest things. On March 25th, my mom's birthday, they told me my leak was healed. I got to go home. 72 hours later, I ended up back in the eMERGE. My infection came back full force. At this point, my wife got extremely distraught. 
whenever I talked to her, I could hear the kids calling for her and she wouldn't do anything. At this point, I had to call the friends to make sure that she was okay. At this point, I demanded that I do not be released until I was 100% good to go because I can't put my wife and family through this roller coaster anymore. Many procedures, more drains of the lungs, more surgeries. I, the leak was 100% good and I was discharged May 3rd. Now this may sound like a, a bad story, but a lot of every, all, every nurse I dealt with, all the porters, all the doctors I dealt with, they said I was the most positive patient they ever seen. I learned a long time ago that you have to be you know, confident in yourself and just take life for what it is. I, I really wanted to focus on getting to know all the nurses, the 195 roommates I had, <laughs> and everyone. Till this day, whenever I visit the Royal Alex, there's still porters, nurses, and you know, x-ray techs that know who I am. I take pride in that. <coughs> Another thing that happened when I was in Unit 34 is whenever there was a patient struggling, they have sometimes moving to my rooms, say, Ryan, can you try to you know, give this guy some feel good. There's one guy from Newfoundland, my wife's hometown, that he always used to complain that he had to fast for 24 hours. I told him I hadn't had a sip of water in two months. <laughs> he turned his tide around. <laughs> <laughs> Another positive thing during this journey was once I had all these complications and my wife was on the wait list for surgery, her, her, her family was 100% against it and almost threatening disowning her. But I'm in a hospital room calling them saying, I would do it again every day, so let her experience this. There was many three sports, sport members who would hear my wife's journey along the way and I, she'd always tell them, he would do it again, so should you. As I said, I would like to thank Dr. Birch, Dr. York, all the doctors who performed the numerous surgeries and procedures on me, the nurses, dietitians, porters, staff, and everyone in this room who continues to make a difference in the obesity field. I'm currently down 160 pounds from my high. I'm hoping to continue this, and my wife, who had surgery in July, is almost down 100. As part of the PEC, which I joined about a year ago, I'm hoping to advocate for more change moving forward so that more people can get the kind of treatment that I had. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ryan. You actually did an amazing job there. Um, there's many of us in, who have to do this for a living who, uh, who still feel nervous, so uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> kudos to you for that. Um, a very powerful story and I think a really great um, uh, framing for, for what's to come. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so next up we're going to have um, uh, uh, Dr. Mary Forhan, uh, who uh, is somebody that I have a huge amount of respect for, a good friend and colleague, um, who's um, going to be um, talking to us today about her work in um, bariatric care, so looking at health services research in bariatric care living while lo losing. And Mary is, is uh, based at the University of Alberta. Um, and I think many of you in the room will know of the work that she's done, which has been really um, incredible um, and actually has had a lot of uh, impact in the, the um, development, I think, of the Public Engagement Committee. And um, uh, I think some, several of the patients from here actually do work with you or have been, been involved with you over time. So uh, again, she's a, a very well-known person in the field in this. So thank you. <coughs> Hey, thank you, Sarah. Um, I had to get the tears out of my eyes, Ryan. That was un in unbelievable. And I, I think I, I agree with Sarah that it's uh, setting um, a really lovely tone to look forward to solutions. I think we spend a lot of time identifying all the problems and the barriers, which is important, but we want to start focusing on solutions. So I should have probably learned how to use this. Oh, the green button. Oh, thank you, <laughs> sorry. Um, so in terms of disclosure slides, um, I do have some uh, support uh, I'm very grateful for, so I have it listed there. Um, in terms of honorarium, um, I am on a speaker's bureau. I don't actually get paid necessarily for speaking, but I put it on there because I do speak sometimes on behalf of the university and uh, Queen's University. I'm doing some talks that I get paid to do and the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists. Um, 
I do get some, I have received consulting fees from the University uh, Health Network in Toronto, and I am an employee of the University of Alberta, which may, in some people's minds, have some bias, so I wanted to declare that. Um, I have not received any financial support for anything uh, for this particular presentation. I think that's it. <laughs> So, oh, the, and one more legal slide. Um, <laughs> I will refer to evidence um, to help mitigate any bias. And when I have studies that are in progress, I will uh, be very forthright that they have not been peer reviewed yet. So I'm going to talk about living while losing um, and contributions from health service research. Um, as some of you have heard me say before, I was an occupational therapist for about 25 years before I went into academic life. And I had the priv privilege of hearing stories from individuals living with obesity when I was working in a clinic uh, that was a weight management clinic back in the 90s and early 2000s. And the stories I kept hearing were um, I'm going to put my life on hold until I lose weight. And so I want to put some of that in context and how we support our, our clients and our patients in if they are in obesity treatment program or receiving care, how we can help them with that. So the learning objectives I have here are to learn about the impact of obesity on access to quality care in hospital settings, to learn about factors that contribute to quality care and outcomes, including length of stay and patient satisfaction and access to care, and to learn about some strategies to promote uh, quality care. So the stories that I was hearing and some of the research that I did when I was doing my PhD, and I finished that in 2010, was that individuals who were receiving treatment for obesity were putting their lives on hold until they had lost a predetermined amount of weight. And it's not unusual, I think, for a lot of us to hear that, well, I, I have goals, but those goals don't seem reasonable or accessible to me until I lose X number of pounds or kilograms. And we know that obesity treatment is very complex and takes a very long time. So for people to put their lives on hold for a year, two years, three years, five years is asking an awful lot. And so we really need to reframe that we need to support our clients who life goes on even when they're in treatment for obesity and how do we support them through that. Um, I heard very narrow life roles. So um, patients saying that um, I'm, I'm not gonna really focus in on too much because this is my goal right now, this is my, my life role, is to focus on managing the obesity. But as you heard so eloquently from Ryan, life goes on even when you're in ICU, he's managing family support and trying to um, keep everybody else around him supported and positive from his hospital bed, which is quite remarkable. So we need to be able to find ways that patients are, are not feeling that um, life is on hold. Okay, so in terms of expectations of healthcare services, um, what w I was finding in some of the research that I was doing and hearing these stories was that um, in terms of access to healthcare, uh, individuals living with obesity had very low expectations about the quality of care that they deserved or could expect to receive. And therefore the bar was very, very low in terms of um, being very tolerant if things weren't going well or they weren't treated with respect, which is not okay. Um, and I heard comments like, I expect to be treated with disrespect. That way when I, it happens, it's no surprise. Um, I expect to have to fight to be heard. Um, I expect that the equipment needed to support my size and weight will not be available. So I didn't hear this from Ryan, but I know um, Ryan and I have spoken a bit. Uh, the transitions, Ryan had many multiple transitions through the healthcare system from emergency to ICU to a ward bed to a specialty care program, probably multiple diagnostic trips that he, you probably weren't even aware of because of the fog that you were in, but lots of journeys and lots of transport through the hospital that we know patients of size experience delays in care because we're searching for the right equipment to get them there. So that can cost lives when we have delays in care and service. And when I was talking with patients about their experiences being in a hospital for whatever reason, the bar was so low in their expectations, which I was quite concerned about. Um, and historically, there has been a low demand from individuals living with obesity to demand better quality care and demand good service and access to equipment and various programs because there's this overarching 
thought of, well, I don't deserve this, or I've been told so long that I did this to myself, that it's up to me to deal with this, that I shouldn't expect the system to accommodate me. I'm so pleased that that is shifting, that is changing, and it's through groups like the patient engagement, or sorry, uh, public engagement. It's 8.30 on the morning, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, and the, it's interesting that the historical low demand for good quality care hasn't been there because when we start looking at the statistics, at any given time, it's estimated that more than 35% of patients in a hospital, for whatever reason, has obesity. So it's not an insignificant number of people, yet the system hasn't been very good at accommodating them. And I think it depends on where you are, too, but we need some more universal access. In research that we've done with, uh, with um, my research group, and some of you may have heard my postdoc fellow Tezuko Tereda um, presenting some of the cardiac research that we've done, we have found that patients with obesity spend almost twice as long in hospital compared to patients with the same reason for admission that do not have obesity. And what we are starting to find out as we dig a bit deeper through this is that the reasons are often um, complications, unexpected complications, an interesting thing that we're starting to find is that a lot of patients are coming in with their diabetes well under control, but the hospital admission, all control for managing their diabetes is taken away and suddenly things aren't going so well. So if we're trying to find ways, and, and I know that the Alberta Health Services is doing some great stuff to help patients better manage their diabetes while they're in hospital on their own so, because they know how to do that best. And we'll find that that actually will promote healing when people's diabetes is under good control and they're nutritionally stable for the healing process. One of the things that we see a lot is post-surgical infections that cost um, in hospital length of stay to increase. The other thing that we find is that patients are waiting longer to be seen. Ryan talked about waiting in emergency, which what sounded like a very, very critical and very obvious um, emergency issue and having to go and advocate to be seen. Um, so we're seeing that people are waiting longer for care as well. As many as 60% of patients with obesity report being stigmatized by healthcare professionals. Um, Ryan spoke very positively about the people that he interacted with. Ryan is a very positive um, uh, individual uh, and uh, it's hard to imagine that someone could be um, disrespectful to a patient such as Ryan, but it does happen and it happens to patients every day. So this is some research that's come out of the US. Uh, more than 50% of healthcare professionals report feeling uncomfortable and unprepared to work with patients with obesity. So there is a poster, I, can't, I think it might be today, that uh, is showing that we have done some surveys and, oh, it was the Petacucha, sorry, it was yesterday, and uh, a colleague of mine, Jennifer Bennett, uh, reported on survey results that we did at Alberta Health Services where we reported fairly high levels of weight bias, but that's not unique to Alberta Health Services. That is across the Canadian healthcare system. So patients with obesity have been refused medical care due to their size. Um, they've been refused um, emergency care. Things are always blamed on their weight and it really serious things are missing. Um, patients with obesity are receiving rehabilitation interventions that have never been tested or validated for use on individuals with a BMI over 30. So we, I, I'm a rehabilitation um, specialist and we use the same techniques and modalities on individuals with obesity and we don't have evidence to show that maybe we need to do things a bit differently. And when a patient takes longer to rehabilitate, we blame the patient. We don't blame our intervention. So this is an area of research that's got a big gap. So if people are interested in doing that, that's a very much needed area. Um, I run an interprofessional research team. I am incredibly fortunate to have really great people mentoring me, supporting me, and working with me. Um, I work with individuals who are living with obesity, are part of my research team. I have industrial designers that work with me to help address some of the issues around access to equipment and space and place and to make sure that things are safe and appropriate and aesthetically pleasing, uh, that they don't stand out as being bariatric equipment. Um, I uh, am looking at uh, rehabilitation therapies and how we can improve those for access and effectiveness for patients living with obesity. 
We have nursing, medicine, economics, analytics, health administrators, and policymakers all at some point along our research. So it's very com comprehensive in terms of all the angles that we're looking at. So one of the things that we're working on, because we know that the system is hit and miss depending on where a patient lives or which healthcare professional they happen to interact with, we want to develop accreditation standards for hospitals that consider bariatric care needs so that patients with obesity coming into the hospital get the same equity and access to care that patients without obesity receive. We want standard labeling of equipment. You heard Ryan's story, and you can imagine the quickness with which all of that happened. No one has time to look up a manufacturer label to see whether the gurney that we would put a patient such as Ryan on can actually support Ryan and is safe for Ryan. So we need quick ways of being able to access that. Um, data collection methods that record important patient, sorry, important patient data uh, care contacts and outcomes that are seamless. Uh, Any time I've been trying, well, uh, most of the time when I'm trying to access larger databases, there is so much missing data on patients with obesity, it's really hard to do it. So oftentimes patient weight and height is not recorded in the chart, or if it is, it's been quickly asking someone, oh, how much do you weigh? So it's not necessarily accurate, maybe underestimating or overestimating. So we need more seamless ways because without that data, researchers like the people that I work with, we can't advocate for more resources for bariatric, to meet the bariatric care needs of patients when we can't even describe what that is in numbers that make sense to administrators when we're asking for money for bariatric beds or a higher ratio of nurses to patients, those kinds of things. And then we also um, are really working closely with the Public Engagement Committee to have patients advocate with us, um, with stories, because I think that is so important to ground the message that we're trying to um, achieve. So there we go, just a very quick overview about how health services research um, is really identifying some of the barriers and some of the successes uh, in our healthcare system, particularly in hospital, that help patients move through the system more effectively. So I'm hoping that um, the project we're doing is a pilot project with Medicine Hat Regional Hospital. I think some of you are, are here this morning, and we are so excited. They are going to be the first hospital in Canada where we are testing standards to meet the bariatric care needs of all patients coming into the hospital and we're hoping that that will set the standard and have universal guidelines that any hospital in Canada can use. So stay tuned, uh, it's very early in our research for that. So thank you very much. Okay, we have time for, is this on? Yeah. We have some time for some questions for um, Mary. Has anybody, um, anybody want to ask a question? Because if not, I will, because I have one. <laughs> so, um, oh, yep, yeah, go for it. I'm going to go and deliver this. Oh, Kristen, do you want it? <laughs> I'm going to go the 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 Actually, I'm going to be the Oprah of the day. Like, uh, you know, if you have any questions, like in the audience, I'm going to go and deliver this pizza to you. All right? Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering about the 60%. Uh, you said uh, uh, of the patients were stigmatized. Uh, that seems low to me. How did you come up with those numbers? Yeah. Great question. Uh, so this came out of some uh, research that was done by Rebecca Pohl out of the um, Rudd Center um, for Food and Obesity Policy. And what she, they did was they surveyed uh, people who were, had some contact with healthcare professionals, and that's the number they came up with. And I think your point is well taken that it probably is higher. But my thoughts on that are that when I've been working with patients uh, in healthcare settings, they're reluctant to complain. So I think it might be that they're not recognizing that the stigma is happening or it's become so part of the norm of their everyday that it is normalized, which is not okay. So I think that's a very good point that it probably is higher than that. Yeah. So I'm uh, really interested in the bariatric care standards um, and what a great opportunity to be able to do that with Medicine Hat. Yes. Um, I guess my question is knowing, well, actually, Nova Scotia, we are going to be building a, a new facility um, at some point, but uh, what do you do about buildings that are already in existence and how do we retrofit 
the um, things that we need. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a good question. We get asked that a lot, and um, the we have to really establish this relationship with people at all levels. You know, architectures, builders, people who finance these projects, and individuals living with obesity need to be at the table as well to really demonstrate like this is what we're talking about here, what we need. Um, retrofitting is tough because it's expensive. So I, th I think the way I try to, to advocate for this, and this is where the data is really much more needed, is putting some cost analysis on that. That yes, it may cost you X amount of thousands of dollars to put a beam in so that you can support an overhead lift so that you can have access to a lifting mechanism to, to make it safer for the patient and safer for the healthcare team, um, is to be able to say, if that installation can save two nurses from going off on disability because they've injured themselves because they didn't have access or knowledge on how to use the right equipment, or a patient gets injured and spends three more months in hospital because of that. If we put a dollar value to that, that's where we have some leverage. So th that's why we need that data, so that we can start linking um, health service um, provider injuries and patient injuries or near misses with um, obesity. Right now we can't match those two things up, so we really don't have um, hardcore data to be able to say that. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Oh. <laughs> this is my exercise. Hi. Yeah, my question is just about the data, and I was just wondering what the um, major obstacles are to the the uh, data that you, you want and need? Yeah, that's a great question, because when I first started doing this kind of research of, about four years ago, I'm like, oh, the data will be there, it'll be easy, this is awesome, I can't wait to do it. So I was kind of surprised at how much was missing. And when we started talking with healthcare providers, saying, you know, what can we do to help you get this data in there? Um, right now, there's no way of forcing um, through an electronic record that they have to enter that data before they can close the file, or it's not being recorded because other things are priorities at the time while they're doing patient care. The biggest obstacle we've heard is that it takes time, or the perception is it's going to take time, or, well, I know this patient has obesity just by looking at them, and I'm uncomfortable asking to get their weight because I don't, it, it, I'm awkward with that conversation. So there's a few things. I think one of it is just lack of comfort and being able to engage in that conversation because sometimes it requires a little more involvement in being able to take the weight depending on the ability of the patient. Um, I think it's also not recognizing the value of that information and how, as researchers, we can leverage that to actually improve the care environment. And I think one of the things we're doing at Medicine Hat, I'm going to say it publicly, I don't know if it's actually going to happen or not, but is we want to change the way that documentation is done so healthcare providers don't have a choice but to enter that data, that it's going to become just as important as age or healthcare number. Yeah. In pediatrics, yeah. Um, I don't have a lot of experience in pediatrics um, with regards to obesity. Um, oftentimes I'll hear, uh, and I have talked with some people at the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital in, in Alberta that work in pediatrics. They're not finding equipment issues and those kinds of things as um, challenging because they'll use adult size equipment for the children. It seems to work for them. I'm not saying it's ideal, but that's um, less of an issue, I think, with pediatrics. Um, the, the stigma, I would imagine, the weight bias and the stigma is probably very prevalent. Um, that's a great question. I don't know how some of this is going to translate uh, into the pediatric care, but um, I'm sure that it would, be, it would be an interesting collaboration if people were interested in doing that. Yeah. One more question. Yes. So, yeah. Hang on. <laughs> this is why Pascal is doing this, because there's <laughs> no way I'm leaping off the <laughs> stage. <laughs> um, well, uh, two questions. I won't get to the second one, perhaps. There is uh, more than just an access to equipment issue. It is also where the equipment is placed. Uh, and I'm from the States. BMI is required on our medical records for anybody that's uh, over 65. We don't have any requirement down lower, but they are starting to put it in. 
the nurses do the BMI, the doctors ignore it. Mm -hmm. There is no other metric that is used, even though in adult males, other metrics are better. But you have to look at where your, your scales are placed. Yeah. If you have a bariatric scale and it's in the front of the clinic, you will have people refuse to absolutely. get on it, even though that information may be important in your delivery of care. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important point, too, is um, when we talk about designing the healthcare environment, we have to think about, as you said, where things are placed and how that's perceived um, as maybe a barrier to being able to follow through with things. I just want to say one quick thing about the BMI, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Um, height and weight are important because we can calculate BMI. I, as a rehab person, and I'm really interested in the shape, like the, the actual physical shape of the individual, because BMI doesn't really tell me much. It might for the weight, so I can make sure the equipment I have is safe and appropriate, but I need to know various things about what sling I need, what the shape of the individual is. So I would be thrilled if we could even get waist circumference on there to at least give me a little bit of idea of the shape, um, but that is probably gonna take a long time, so I'll settle for height and weight right now. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks again, Mary. All right, so we're going to take uh, a little move there towards the, uh, like, from the health services. We're going to move towards, like, the, I would say, more physiological aspect of obesity, and it's going to be uh, a talk delivered by my colleague and friend, actually, Jennifer Cook, uh, who is an exercise physiologist, and Jennifer is uh, located at uh, York. She's an associated professor there. And as you know, Jennifer is uh, very highly involved in this uh, community. So uh, please welcome Jennifer to entertain us on benefits and obesity and an intended consequence, so a provocative uh, title there. So Jennifer, we're looking forward to it. <laughs> Okay, so before you throw rotten tomatoes at me, I'm not going to say that there are no negative effects of obesity and there are no positive effects of weight loss. I just think that we talk about them a lot and it's uh, important as researchers to weigh both sides of the coin and this side of the coin, the, you know, the, the benefits of having obesity and, and, the, and the negative effects of weight loss are often you know, ignored or, 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 or less emphasized. And so in order for you to make a, a really informed decision, you, you should really talk about both. Okay, so in terms of my disclosure, I, uh, I receive uh, royalties from Nelson Education for the, the textbook that I, that I write for my course. It has nothing to do with uh, what I'm speaking about today. And um, I do work with the Wharton Medical Clinic, but they pay me no money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, all the things that I, I do receive money for uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the honorariums for speaker fees um, are not related to what I'm talking about today. Uh, but if you would like to give me money to do things, I, I'm more than open to that as well. Okay, um, so I need to promote myself. So, no, it doesn't, which is why I'm still promoting. So today we're going to uh, cover some of the uh, variations in, in how health risk is expressed in those with obesity and maybe talk about some of the, the negative uh, things that happen with uh, well, weight loss and particularly failed weight loss. Um, and so well, how do we consider and balance those things when we do encourage participants to, to lose weight? And is that actually the, the path of least harm? And then we're going to understand some of the subpopulations where maybe the risks actually outweigh some of the benefits. Okay, so when we take a look at the causes of obesity, and, and there's many people much more qualified uh, than myself to speak about some of these things, um, you know, generally we only talk about the diet and exercise components, um, you know, large portion sizes, sugar, processed foods, and obviously that is going to have a role in the growing ob obesity epidemic and low physical activity levels, certainly that is likely playing a role as well, but there's other things that are well beyond our control, such as environmental pollutants, the medications that we take, which are good for your health, but they have weight gain as a side effect. How do you balance those two things? Do you tell someone, don't take your depression medication because you'll gain weight? How do you weigh those two things? Um, air pollution, reductions in ambient temperature, all of these things influence the way that we regulate our appetite, the way that we regulate our metabolism. Can you control the air that you breathe? Can you control the chemical compounds that are on your clothes right now, which some of you will be more prone to and sensitive to and cause you to gain weight? 
Okay, so when we think about all these complex factors, we can't target. Is it fair to someone to just look at the two things that we can and how much of an impact will that actually realistically have? One of the things that uh, we, were, we, we did is we looked at you know, the, the relationship between diet and body weight over time. And so we took some uh, American data from the 70s and uh, from 1975 to 2008. And what we saw is that if you control for the caloric intake, you eat the same in 1975, you're gonna weigh more in 2008. And so how much is that? For the same caloric intake, you're gonna weigh about 20 pounds more. 20 pounds more because you were born later in life. So whenever your parents tell you that you have it easier, you say, no, I have it 20 pounds heavier. Okay. <laughs> When we take a look at uh, physical activity, we saw the same patterns. And so when we take a look at these lifestyle factors, there are other things that are promoting this obesity gain beyond those two things. When we take a look, can you be healthy with obesity? Um, again, this is uh, American data, but it's very similar in Canada, I'm sure. When you take a look at those with obesity, 94% have some sort of cardiometabolic risk factor. Okay, and then you would say, well, yeah, that, that's because obesity is associated with health risk. Um, but um, how about if we add more things? Because typically we only use metabolic syndrome. So I added some other uh, data that I had available in the data set. So I added cholesterol, uh, LDL, apo, uh, apolipo A, B, liver inflammation. And as you can see, the number's going higher. You know, I'm a good Chinese girl. I'm striving for 100%. So I, I added physical activity and then uh, diet, angina, cardiovascular disease, cancer, all these things. And so finally, I attained my 100%. My father was very proud of me. <laughs> Okay, and so I can uh, confidently now say that obesity is related with health risk. But if you look at the normal weight bar, 99.3% also had at least one of these factors that I list. So are any of us really healthy? How important is it when you have 100% in those with obesity with some sort of health factor and 99% of normal weight? Is it weight that's really that important? So the other thing uh, I, I like to ask is, you know, does the cause of obesity perhaps change the relationship with health risk? Okay. Um, and so if you think about diabetes medications and blood pressure medications, there are some that have weight gain as a side effect. So how do you balance the two when you have a diabetes medication that's improving your insulin sensitivity, yet promoting weight gain? How do you balance those two? Because obviously it's altering that risk profile that you would expect for that BMI. So we looked at antidepressants because they, they don't really have a direct uh, cardiovascular uh, effect. And what we saw is if you adjust for BMI and make the two groups the same, what you see is that typically the users of this specific antidepressant will have a worse cardiovascular profile than um, if uh, those that, that were not using it. And, and this uh, particular antidepressant medication was associated with weight gain. So it's a double whammy. You gain more weight and the health effects of that weight gain are perhaps even worse uh, because of the medication that you're on. Another type of antidepressant that is typically associated with weight loss followed by weight gain, we see that you typically have better cardiovascular benefits. And so again, depending on how you arrived at your elevated BMI, there may be alterations in terms of your cardiovascular risk profile, which we may or may not actually even acknowledge. Okay, uh, organophosphate pollutants, so these are the pesticides in the room um, uh, and are in many of the, the foods that we eat that have fat in them. Um, when we take a look, there's many different types of uh, organ or, or, uh, organopollutants that are available in the environment for us to consume, um, but we have no control and I have no idea what is in the organic green tea that I, I consumed this morning, but most of these compounds that we looked were associated with worse cardiovascular profile. And then there was this one that made us scratch our heads uh, that is associated with better. Uh, metabolic profile. So if I want a pollutant, I want this one. I have no idea where it comes from or how it enters my body, but if I had a choice, I, that's the one I would want. Okay. Um, and so when we think about organic pollutants, we, we typically say, oh, those are bad for you, but it's just a chemical compound like any drug. It could have good effects, it could have bad effects. And so understanding how these things influence not only body weight, but how it relates to, how body weight relates to health is also very important and very complicated. So the, the next question I'm going to address is, you know, do you benefit 
from, from weight loss. And so if you know the Edmonton obesity uh, staging system, you know, stage zero, stage one, you have very minimal uh, health, uh, negative health effects from your obesity. Do, do these people uh, benefit? So we looked at it, that and some of the, the data that we had from the Wharton Medical Clinic, and we divided the, the patients up into those that would uh, classify under the, the various uh, uh, metabolically healthy or, or metabolically unhealthy. And what we saw is that if you are unhealthy, you lose weight, you improve your metabolic health status. So I, I should win an award for that. It's, it's very, you know, groundbreaking research. Um, but the, the surprising thing that we saw is that even in the patients that had uh, obesity and a, and a healthy metabolic profile, they still saw improvements in uh, their cardiovascular risk profile. So just because you are under these, you know, these guideline cutoffs that we have doesn't mean that you wouldn't further benefit, okay? Um, but not everyone agrees with me. And uh, some of our, our Canadian colleagues show that, you know, weight loss is associated with uh, worse insulin resistance. So you become more diabetic-like after diet weight loss, okay? And so whether or not healthy individuals receive the cardiovascular benefit from weight loss is not entirely agreed upon, okay? And the other thing that we need to consider is that obesity is actually associated with fewer life years lost over time. So if you compare 1980 versus 1990, what you're looking at is, is the, uh, the, the bars going down means that you're losing less years of your life due to obesity. And so what you can see is that over time, obesity is not as bad, okay? And you might go, how is that possible? And if you think about it, we have a lot more medications now for, for diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, all the negative things that we think about when we have obesity, we have a lot more effective treatments nowadays. So what is the health effect of obesity when you treat all of these other things that come with it? Um, and, and perhaps that's, that's what we're seeing in terms of the improvement in longevity. Um, so do all populations have a negative effect of, on, on longevity due to obesity? And this is some of the work that I did with my, my colleague, uh, Chris Ardern at York. And we looked at, uh, we were replicating a, a study by, by an American group that only looked at BMI where they showed that, you know, older individuals with a higher BMI actually have uh, better mortality risk, better mortality risk, but only in that older population. So lumping everybody together may be masking something, but, you know, we were thinking we know abdominal obesity is bad, so we did the study again using waist circumference. And what we saw is the exact same thing. It doesn't matter if you use BMI or waist circumference, if you are older than 65 years of age, there's this negative relationship between obesity and, and mortality risk. So obesity is actually perhaps good in older people. And another population where obesity might actually be beneficial for survival are, are surviving from uh, things such as um, heart failure, cancer, peripheral artery disease, heart disease, flu, and et cetera. There's, there's many studies that if you look in the literature, they actually show patients that have obesity are more likely to survive these conditions. You're more likely to get them, but you're also more likely to survive it. So there's this paradox that you can, you know, spin around in your head for a few times and think about it until you have a headache and don't complain to me. But so what it is, is it means that it's very complicated because, you know, on one hand, you're more likely to get these conditions. On the other hand, we're better able to treat them. And if you do have them, you're, you're better able to survive. And people ask me all the time, well, why? I don't know, I'm not that smart, but you know, one of the theories that is, is put out there is that you have more of a metabolic reserve. One of the common symptoms that you see whenever you get any chronic condition or any con illness in general is weight loss. If you have more of a metabolic reserve, then you're more likely to be able to survive them from that. And I think that we need to move around, away from thinking that you know, fat tissue is bad. Fat tissue is not bad, it's an energy store. If we didn't have fat tissue and we relied on car you know, glycogen, all the time, we'd be these huge, massive, watery masses walking around. We wouldn't be able to walk, we could probably roll around uh, because we'd be so heavy. Fat is a very efficient fat store, or energy store for us, and it's important for us. Yeah. So 
uh, what about this, this metabolically healthy uh, population that I talked about? Do, do they have a higher risk of dying? And so this is again some work that I did with my, my colleague, uh, Chris Ardern, where we, we separated individuals into the metabolically healthy and unhealthy group. And what we saw was that I was wrong. So this, this metabolically healthy group, they actually had the same mortality risk as the unhealthy. So there was something that is inherent about obesity that still makes it that you, you die earlier. But in this study, we kind of cheated a little bit because we used, you know, we included people with one risk factor as healthy. Why did we do that? It's because we were underpowered. We didn't have enough to look at the zero metabolic risk factor groups. And, and, but it was common in literature. And when you look at all of the literature that's out there, that definition that's used for healthy is one risk factor or zero. And I think I, you, you can easily see that someone with hypertension alone shouldn't really be classified as healthy. So um, I did the study again. It's taken me six years to merge all of these uh, data sets. Um, and uh, what now I'm actually powered. We have about 650,000 people. Uh, and, and we can look at healthy by using zero risk factors. And what do I see? There's still an elevated risk. 30%, but it's better than two and a half. Um, so there is still this elevated mortality risk associated with having an elevated BMI alone. Why is that? It could be barriers to uh, health care because of the, the bias. It could be that things are diagnosed later in life, like or cancer at later stages because of their size, it's harder to diagnose. We're not exactly sure, but it, it does show that obesity in itself might have some health risk associated with it. But when you compare it to, say, glucose alone or blood pressure alone, you can see that the hazards ratios are much bigger for the, these other risk factors. So if you put it on a scale in terms of, well, these things are health risk factors, obesity really isn't that high up on the scale compared to the other things that we typically look at. Okay, and that's all unpublished, so you know, I could have made it up. <laughs> okay, so um, next uh, we're going to take a look at the uh, Edmonton Obesity Staging System. Again, when we took a look at that system, there wasn't an elevated health risk, and so maybe there is something in terms of how you categorize them. But the other thing I wanted to show to you is, you know, we always talk about the benefits of weight loss, but when we take a look at studies that show whether or not weight loss is associated with uh, decreases in mortality risk, you know, there, there are some in the literature, but it's not that prevalent that we see, even if you look at intentional weight loss. And in the studies that show intentional weight loss are associated with lower health risk, we also see that weight gain may also be associated with lower health risk or mortality risk. Okay, and again, it might be due to the timing of when you lose that body weight. And particularly if you have that, uh, the, the weight gain early in life, it seems to be negative, but not so much later in life. And again, it has to do with, you know, the different effects of aging on the relationship between BMI and mortality risk. And in fact, surgery is the only way that you actually see a clear reduction in mortality risk. Um, but shockingly, only 23% of patients attending the Wart Medical Clinic actually want bariatric surgery. They don't want it. Why? We don't know. Um, but what we see is that all the patients that are interested report discrimination. And you might say that's a really good thing, but discrimination actually is associated with worse weight outcomes. Higher weight loss goals, but worse overall weight outcomes. And so when you take a look at the results from the, you know, real weight management, we see that very, very few people are able to sustain large weight losses that, that might be necessary for these improvements in mortality risk. So are we really telling people to do this mission impossible? And when people repeatedly fail, again, there's evidence in the literature that perhaps that increases your risk for things like diabetes or cardiovascular disease, even if you adjust for BMI. Things like artificial sweeteners may have some effect for some patients in, in helping you lose weight. But we've shown uh, using Ann Haynes data that perhaps these individuals that consume aspartame actually have a worse diabetes profile when you look at the same BMI. And so is the, the cure worse than the actual condition? So is obesity always bad? I'd say probably not. Is, is weight loss always good? M maybe not. And uh, given that most fail, should individuals with obesity try to lose weight? And so that's, that's unclear, and you really have to weigh all these things for the patient that you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Very nice.
Uh, we certainly have time for some questions, and again, I can deliver this microphone to the uh, interested people. Excellent, I'm going. Run, run yes. as fast as you can. Yes, Jennifer, can I? Hoppa. There you go, madam. Hi, thank you for that. That was fantastic. It's good to see this work here. Um, I have a bit of a, maybe a reflexive um, comment around the use of language, and I think if we're talking about trying to deal with bias, stigma, discrimination, trying to really outroot it, I don't think we should be talking about people who fail. I think we should be talking about treatments that fail. So that's just that when that, I just want to say that as a little bit of language, and it's only saying that in the, like, this is such fantastic work, but that's just one thing I would really like us to trouble. Thanks for that. I will try and change. Hi, Jen. Thanks for the good talk. It's nice to see something refreshing. My students were hate your last slide. It was like, it's maybe not, probably yes. Uh, they want white and, uh, black and white answers. Um, I just want to hear you about uh, the fact that we are Canadian, we're living here, we're having Canadian data, but we always, and I do the same, polish with American data. And why are you doing the same? And just like have a comment on that. Um, working with Canadian data is very difficult because the, the healthcare, uh, well, Health Canada likes to control the population data in research centers or data centers. So you actually have physically need to go to the data center to access the data. You can only take it out once. And so when you get comments back from reviewers that say do these additional analyses, then you need to basically beg them to allow you to do those extra analyses and then <coughs> um, put those new analyses in the paper that you submit. And so that's to protect the Canadian so that actually participated in the surveys, but it makes it very challenging as a researcher to try and use that data. And I certainly wouldn't be able to merge that Canadian data with anything else. And so it, again, it's just about access. All right, just to uh, respect the timeline here, we're gonna just close the session, but I'm suggesting to offer a tea to Jennifer. Jennifer, she's a, a tea drinker, so you can join her at the coffee break, and I'm sure that Jennifer will answer your question. So just to uh, conclude, and not, but not the least, actually, we're gonna move towards um, the last um, presentation of this uh, session. So this is gonna be um, presented by Dr. Lori Twells. Dr. Twells uh, is an associate professor uh, from the eastern part of Canada, so Newfoundland, and she is with the School of Pharmacy. And uh, Lori will uh, entertain us on uh, the before and the after of bari bariatric surgery. So Lori, please. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you to the organizers for asking me to speak today. And thank you all for coming out to this early session, because I know how difficult it is sometimes, especially after an evening con social, which do tend to go on quite late. I've been there before. Um, as Pascal said, I'm from Newfoundland and Labrador, um, which actually is quite convenient coming this way in terms of a conference, because I've been waking up at 3 a.m. for the last three mornings. So I'm feeling extremely energetic. And it's actually lunchtime, so getting a bit hungry as well. Um, but are there any other Newfoundlanders in the room? I see my student. Oh, we've got somebody over there. Oh, fantastic. Um, I was looking through the program a couple of weeks ago, uh, just trying to see whether or not any other colleagues were coming to the conference. And I was quite surprised to see that just about all the talks that I saw in the conference abstract book were either mine or my students, um, which is also surprising given that we have some of the highest rates of obesity in the country. And we do have a lot, a lot of people doing some really good work in Newfoundland, um, but unfortunately haven't been able to come to the conference. What I'm going to be talking about today is um, living with obesity before and after bariatric surgery. And most of the research I'm going to present to you is actually research from patients' perspectives. I don't have any disclosures, a little bit like Jennifer, looking for money, but don't have any. <laughs> uh, most of my research has just been funded through granting agencies or in-kind support where I actually have begged for money. So my presentation objectives are to describe experiences of living with severe obesity in individuals who are actually seeking treatment, to examine individuals' reasons for seeking treatment and their weight loss goals, to understand health-related quality of life before and after surgery, and to describe patients' relationships with food, weight loss, progress, and well-being 12 months after surgery. 
So many of us have seen these types of slides being presented over the last couple of days. Um, and all my research is really focused on severe obesity. So those are people who typically have BMIs greater than 35 or 40. And, and they're often referred to either morbid obesity or severe obesity. Um, this um, figure on the left, or my left, um, is work that we published a couple of years ago actually looking at the epidemiology of obesity in Canada. Um, and a lot of this work often does get published in the States and often those figures are used from using uh, American data. But our data pretty much replicates um, American data as well in terms of increases in severe obesity. So what you can see in the top two lines is actually BMIs greater than 35 and 40 and there's been an exponential increase in severe obesity in Canada since 1985. That increase accounts to about 400%. Obesity or class one obesity is actually leveling off, so that's the sort of red and green lines, and have been relatively stable over the last couple of years. But it's those increases in severe obesity that we're primarily concerned about because we know the health risk just shoots up as well in terms of the excess body weight that happens in those categories. In the last 10 years, we've also seen an increase in bariatric surgery being offered in Canada, um, accounting to about a 300% increase. That's, that's data that goes back to 2006. Um, so in terms of a demand for treatment for severe obesity and an effective treatment, we're seeing the demand go up as well. Um, in Canada, as you can see here, we can look at the prevalence, and this is again severe obesity, not just obesity. The, the prevalence of severe obesity in Canada is about 5%, um, and that varies across the country. Um, as you can see in the darker green areas, the prevalence is 7 to 8%. The numbers are a bit small there. Um, in Canada, the prevalence of severe obesity is about 7%. So we have about 30,000 people in our province alone living with severe obesity. So in terms of absolute numbers, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people who could be eligible for bariatric surgery. Um, it's certainly not as many as the half a million people living in Ontario, um, but it's less than the sort of 100,000 living in, or and even more than the 100,000 living in BC. Um, but those people all don't want surgery. Um, they might be eligible for surgery, but of course they won't be demanding bariatric surgery as a treatment. So in, based on the sort of increase in severe obesity uh, in Canada in general, and then the prevalence of obese, severe obesity in Newfoundland and Labrador, there was a bit of a lobbying effort that went on a few years ago by one of the bariatric surgeons who, who became a bariatric surgeon, Dr. Dave Pace, around getting a program started um, at our center in St. John's. And for a couple of years, he'd come back after having done fellowship, a fellowship training in bariatric surgery and was really lobbying hard in terms of the health authority and the government to actually offer a treatment to individuals living in our province. We had several um, people who were going out of province, um, trying to actually access treatment in other provinces, other countries, and coming back with, of course, all the problems that sometimes that brings with them in terms of follow-up, but we didn't have a treatment center of our own. I had met actually Dave Pace a few years before that because I'd been teaching in the Faculty of Medicine and in fact he'd been one of my students um, doing a course on research methods and we happened to just bump into each other on the hall one day and he said, you know, Laurie, we're starting up a program here. Would you be interested in doing some research in bariatric surgery? I'd been doing research in obesity for about 10 years um, and said, well, any research? Yes, I'm absolutely interested. And he said, well, you know, just I'll keep it sort of in the loop in terms of the bariatric surgery program. In the meantime, I wasn't even quite sure what bariatric surgery was at that point, and I didn't want to come across as not knowing, so I said, sure, Dave, just you know, keep me in the loop. Uh, in the meantime, I walked back to my office and went via a colleague and popped into her office and said, um, you know, it looks like they're starting up a bariatric surgery program here, um, interested in doing some research with me. And I said, I'm not even quite sure what it is, actually. And she said, well, it's treatment for obesity. And I said, yeah, I know that. And she said, well, I think they do it down in the hyperbaric chamber. I said, really? I said, that seems very strange. So off I went to my office thinking, okay, this is, this is going to be strange treatment for obesity, um, sort of without oxygen or something. And I then Googled bariatric surgery, and lo and behold, obviously it's not done in a hyperbaric chamber, um, and realized I probably did know a little bit about some of the things, certainly banding I'd heard about, but certainly none of the other procedures. So since 2010 um, and to this day, I've really been immersed in, in research around bariatric surgery, and it's pretty much all I do at the moment. Um, so as a result, our center did start up a program in 2011, um, and the government agreed to fund 100 bariatric procedures a year. The surgery, a surgeon preference at the time was for laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, so that's the only procedure that we actually offer at our center. So there is no choice for, for patients. And the criteria for surgery is your standard clinical practice guideline criteria, BMI greater than 35 with a comorbidity or BMI over 40. Um, I just want to show you when the surgeons did their first surgery uh, May, in May 2011, 
Um, and I know this patient, and she's given me permission to give you this, but when they took the patient into the OR and actually opened up the gown, this is what they found. This is what the patient had actually put on her belly. Um, congratulations to NL's first vertical sleeve gastrectomy team. With thanks from your patient, Jen Dion, today you are changing my life. And this is somebody who had been trying to access bariatric surgery for years, had been on wait lists in Ontario and in New Brunswick, had continually increased her weight um, to the point that her health was really at risk. She had a five-year-old little boy and was married. Um, and when I found out about the surgery, um, I happened to know this woman and I happened to mention it. Um, so she was one of the first people on the wait list. Um, and she got in extremely quickly, obviously. Um, but that just sort of tells you and, and sort of reflects some of what we've heard today that even though Ryan went through that horrible sort of story, um, at the end he actually still said, I'm glad I did it, I would do it again, I would sort of recommend it. Um, because bariatric surgery can change people's lives. So with that in mind, um, and being a researcher, an academic researcher with all the pressures that go with that, I sort of took that idea and really ran with it. Um, I actually contacted numerous colleagues. We had an opportunity to, to start something new. We had a new program. Um, I did a little bit of research around sleeve gastrectomy in particular, but also bariatric surgery to find out what the gaps in the literature were. And lo and behold, sleeve gastrectomy at the time was an investigational procedure. In 2011, it was actually termed investigational, meaning we didn't know what all the outcomes would be. Um, so that was perfect because we needed to do research. Um, I also found that there were a lot of gaps around looking at patient perceptions. So what do we know about patients waiting for surgery, living with obesity before surgery? What about their expectations about weight loss? What happens to them after surgery? So we actually pulled together quite a qualified team of people, um, qualitative researchers, quantitative researchers, health professionals, um, to actually put a program together. So we didn't just start with one study, we started with several studies. And as you can see here, we looked at studies pre-surgery and we were planning surgeries post-surgery. What I will just talk to you about today is some of the results that have come from a few of these studies, and I'll just be touching on sort of key results just to give you a flavor of what we're actually doing. Um, but the studies in particular are looking at living with obesity before surgery, reasons why actual individuals seek out treatment and their weight loss goals, and then looking at their health-related life after surgery and some of their perceptions of well-being and how they've defined sort of success after surgery. So I'm putting this slide up here just to remind us all, as we all know, that obesity is now considered a disease. Um, and when I started this research back in 2010, and even previous to that, this was always the lens that I looked at obesity research through. I've never looked at it through any other lens, um, in the sense that what I mean by that is, to me, it's a chronic condition, and if it impairs health, it's something we need to do something about. Um, and if we need to do something about it, we need to provide a treatment. Um, so this just makes so much more sense to me now, and I'm so glad to see that we're actually endorsing the fact that actually obesity is a chronic disease. In terms of methodology, just very quickly, we've used various methods. Many of these papers have already been published, so if people would like to look at them, I can certainly share them with you. Um, but we've used qualitative and quantitative methods. We've done extensive interviews with patients. We've used validated instruments to actually assess quality of life, um, and we've measured weight over time through the clinic. Um, one of the first papers we published was on the road, was called The Road to Severe Obesity. Weight loss surgery candidates talk about their histories of weight gain. And I'll just touch on a couple of the themes that came out of this work around the experiences of people living with obesity. So the first theme was struggles with weight began in childhood. And I think we heard that from various of the speakers that have been here at the conference, including Ryan today. Um, it's hereditary. A lot of people in my family are big. I have never been slim. I have never been below a size 18 or 20, never. I don't remember as a child being small. I know that part of it is genetics because I really do believe that. I have a set of grandparents who were huge. I guess it's my metabolism. Second theme, feeling that their weight gain made them not normal. I was never heavy, never. I was always a normal weight or underweight. I was always really thin and wore really stylish clothes. It's really devastating because it's not like I've been fat all my life. The third theme was one around frustration. It frustrates me that I can go to university, I can accomplish all of these degrees, I can do whatever I put my mind to, but I can't lose this weight. It's very, very frustrating. The final theme, which came up again and again, which I always find very quite distressing to read, actually, um, was around the exhaustion. Um, I guess the most I've ever lost at one go is 70 or 80 pounds, which is a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of discipline and denial. Then no matter what, it seems like every time after a couple of months, it starts creeping back. 
all, and then all of a sudden you were where you were or worse. Then it's like, oh my God, how did I do that? How, did I, how could I be so stupid? And these are the things we heard from patients who were waiting for surgery. We then went on to do another study to actually um, assess their goals around weight loss and their expectations um, and using a validated questionnaire. And what we found were these were the key reasons why people wanted surgery in the first place. So these were set questions, and obviously they weren't set up around these themes, um, but when you put the data together, the themes emerged. So in terms of the key reasons why people were seeking treatment, you know, it wasn't like I wanted to look like a celebrity. It wasn't about being the same weight as a friend. It wasn't even about family pressures. It all came down to health. It came down to medical conditions, it came down to physical comfort, and it came down to the mental and emotional health piece, which was feeling how you feel about your psychological health. Those were the top three reasons. In terms of weight loss, one of the things we did find, though, is that actually often patients do have very unrealistic expectations about their weight loss. What this graph is showing you is percent excess weight loss, which is a term that really nobody really understands apart from surgeons, and it's used in the surgical literature to actually define how much excess weight um, we expect you to lose after a procedure. So for example, for sleeve gastrectomy, we expect patients, or we seek based on research, that um, 45 to 60 percent of patients actually lose, or sorry, uh, patients lose 45 to 60 percent of their excess weight. Um, but this is not what patients ex want to lose or expect to lose. They expect to lose much more weight than that, and they'll be disappointed if they don't lose that weight. Um, in terms of living, after ob living with obesity after surgery, um, this is the group of patients that we're now following for several years. And this group of patients, it looks very typical to most bariatric programs across the country. Um, the average age is 44, 80% are female, which is interesting because severe obesity is quite similar in males and females in this country, but more females are actually seeking out treatment. The average BMI is 49. Um, in terms of their comorbidity profile, it's a, it's, a, it's a population with a lot of comorbidities, on average five or six. So close to 50% or more actually have things like hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, sleep apnea, chronic back pain. Um, in terms of their weight loss, what actually transpired in this particular population is patients did lose about 52.6% of their excess weight loss, so they fall into that range that we expect to see which accounts for about 38 kilograms. So it's above where they'd be disappointed, but obviously it's not meeting that sort of area where they might find it acceptable or happy in terms of the amount of weight they're losing. And this was information we fed back to the team in terms of educating patients pre-surgery. Not saying, look, you can have a dream weight and you can have a goal weight, but that may not be what you might expect to see after surgery. In terms of actually their BMI category over time, you can see that baseline, most of the patients obviously because of the criteria, have BMIs greater than 35 or 40. But at the end of two years, that turns into almost a normal distribution where actually most patients are now obese class 2, 1, overweight, or even a couple of normal weight individuals. In terms of the health-related quality of life, um, this was one of the tools we used, which is called the impact of weight on quality of light. light. Um, and it's scored from zero to 100 with higher scores showing that the actual weight is having less impact on particular domains. And so what you can see through these five domains is that actually they've lost quite a bit of weight, so 38 kilos or the equivalent of about 100 pounds. And this has a significant impact on improving their quality of life. So in terms of things like physical function, you can see it goes from 40 up to almost 90. Um, Self-esteem. Because of my weight, I'm embarrassed to be seen in public places. This improves dramatically. They've lost weight and they feel better about themselves. Sexual life. Because of my weight, I avoid sexual encounters whenever possible. The impact on that has been reduced dramatically. Public distress. Because of my weight, I worry about fitting into seats in public places. Again, huge improvements. And, and work as well. Because of my weight, I am less productive than I could be, and there's huge improvement there. Um, in terms of the visual analog scale, which is basically something where patients just come in and on a scale from 0 to 100 on a thermometer type piece of paper, they actually show you on a line where their health, general health is on any given day. Um, 80 is the Canadian norm in terms of the general population, and you can see when patients actually first come in pre-surgery, they're at about 60, but at 12 months and 24 months, this actually, actually gets up to about the Canadian normative data in terms of general population healthy living. Just to show you the context of visual and analog scales around other disease populations and normative data, in the U.S., the general population normative data is about 82. So this is on a scale of 0 to 100, where 0 is worst possible health and 100 is best. Uh, the C Canadian data coming out of Alberta from um, Jeff Johnson's group shows about 85 for Canadian normative data. People are happy in Alberta. 
Um, if you've got coronary heart disease on our medication, your visual analog scale would mark about 63. Type 2 diabetes with medication, about 68. People living with severe obesity in the yellow group are actually coming in at about 74 out of 100. So these are people without comorbid conditions. They're just severely obese, relatively high general health. If you're actually severely obese with chronic conditions, you're down at about 58 or 59. And that's similar data that you'll see in other um, programs as well. So in terms of just qu very quickly the 12-month data, um, looking at patients' relationships with food, weight loss progress, and health-related quality of life, um, these are some of the issues that patients are dealing with as they go forward in time. So some of the key themes were around things like participants verbalized that food addiction and emotional eating continued. It's still a challenge for me. I'm addicted to food. You go through this period of mourning, this period of being depressed because you cannot have the food that comforts you. It's way more mental than physical. It's very hard to be an emotional eater when you have a very tiny stomach. Very hard. Fair was expressed about the possibility of weight regain. If I went back there, I think I would be suicidal. I think I really would. I can't do that again. It's a big fear for me. Third, participants were generally satisfied with the amount of weight lost. There's stuff I can do now that I haven't been able to do before. I can play around with my kids. No words can describe how awesome it is. The fourth theme was strong, it was around surgery. It was strongly recommended by all participants. Get it done. If you have any doubts about it and you want to enjoy life, get it done. Everything is changing now. Finally, number five, participants believe they are much healthier. I don't think I've been to the doctor for anything other than to get my regular three-month prescription pills since I had this done, whereas before I was there every other day. I'm off so many pills that I was on before. That's a big save to the healthcare system. I just want to put this in the context of the quality of life that we also assessed during the same time period to show you that as, as, although quality of life's improved dramatically over time, one of the things that you can see is that anxiety and depression starts to sort of sneak back up. Um, so although there's vast improvements in mobility, self-care, usual activities and pain and discomfort, the anxiety and depression has actually come up past baseline measures. Um, and I think that's in relation to some of the things we just talked about around the fear and anxiety of potential weight regain and being an emotional leader and addicted to food and how that will actually deal with that going forward. So in summary, living with severe obesity is very difficult. Individuals seek treatment for health reasons. Weight loss goals may not match with what can be expected clinically, but weight loss is significant after surgery and health risks are reduced substantially. Quality of life improves significantly after surgery, but challenges with anxiety and depression resurface or may start to appear. Uh, this is a team of people that are contributing to all this research, and there's, there's many others that have come and gone over the last five years. All the funding bodies that have helped, and a iceberg that's just off the coast of our island, which is there, mm -hmm. and you may have seen that in the news. Um, thank you. Thank you. Maybe one short back. Thank you, Lori, and congratulations for setting up uh, this nice team. So uh, just not for impeding your help rate, like maybe just one or two short, short question, if there is any. If, yes, sure. This is a terrific panel. Thank you all so much. Uh, I just had a quick question about post-bariatric surgery outcomes. Uh, you sort of demonstrated some at 24 months. I think typically we see sort of plateauing at around that time and then a potentially some increase over the next few years. Just wondering if those improvements in health-related quality of life uh, continue at, say, sort of four or five years out or whether you have any data on that. Thank you. Uh, very good question. Uh, the patients we're following, we are following for 24 months, but hope to follow for later. But actually, we did publish a systematic review last year looking at health-related quality of life post-bariatric surgery five to 25 years out. And all those improvements, they may come down a little bit, but they're all consistently better than they were before, including the mental health outcomes as well. So all domains actually improved in that time period. So even with some weight regain, you will still see the improvements in health-related quality of life. Thank you, Larry. Um, I just wanted a quick comment, um, picking up on Stasia's comment. Um, what are your thoughts on the fact that perhaps we're at a time now where we can accept that the five-year outcomes from bariatric surgery are very impressive, but perhaps what we need now is a paradigm looking at five to ten years? Because I think what we're starting to see is some 
some obesity-specific psychological issues that appear after surgery, and they tend to grow over time. So after you start working with people after five, 10 years, and some of that emotional eating, some of the addictive issues, even some of the body image types of issues, it sort of lingers around there. So what are your thoughts on whether it maybe it's time for us to sort of accept that the, the, the post and the five-year response is excellent, so we're okay with that. But now maybe what we need to do is take a broader perspective on the lifespan of individuals receiving bariatric surgery. Yeah, I think that's a good question as well. I mean, I guess the issue with certainly sleeve is that, as I said in 2011, it was investigational. So the, some of the health clinical outcome data is actually still needed um, in terms of numbers and a question, and it's obviously a question of recruiting patients and following them over time. But I think the bigger issue and what we keep hearing again and again is, is this is mentally, after surgery, it's all about mental health versus physical health. So the outcomes are good even with regain of weight, but in terms of psychological issues, that's the big unknown at the moment. And something we didn't even touch on here is some of the things that are starting, we're starting to see, like some of the addictions. So if you've had a food addiction which you can no longer feed, you may be starting to develop other addictions. And we have had patients who've gone on to develop some gambling addictions, some sex addictions, some shoplifting addictions as well. So that's a whole other area. And they may only be a few patients, but in terms of the science behind that, we don't really understand that. Superb. So on behalf of my uh, co-chair, Sarah Kirk, I'd like to uh, thanks again my four musketeers this morning for breaking the ice and offering us a very dynamic session. So welcome. Uh, thank you, Ryan, Mary, Jennifer, and Laurie. And we'll invite you to move to the health break and enjoy the remaining of uh, your meeting, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> You're right. Great stuff.